Vale, ya voy. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much uh, to all the people who made this seminar possible, the organizers, also of course to our Serbia colleagues who are visiting us from from the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory. So for me, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be able to, to discuss with you. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, I will have to leave a bit earlier, so I will miss the discussion, so uh, I, I apologize for that. Um, okay, so my text, um, it's entitled The Vulnerable Subject, Butler Reading Hegel, and you can follow on the screen, so I will read to be clear for everyone. Okay, so in this contribution, uh, I would like to explore the tie between the notion of vulnerability and the critique of the sovereign subject in Butler's later thought. Uh, I will discuss uh, three different points. First of all, I will trace this connection in Butler's reception of Hegel's idea of recognition, especially as it appears in Phenomen Phenomenology of Spirit. Recognition, as the consciousness apprehends out of the experience of the master and the slave, is always reciprocal and never, never unilateral. Second point, um, then, as also other readers of Hegel have noted, like um, Nancy, Mal Mal Malabu or Gijek, the subject is not sovereign, but always out of oneself. Alterity is then an inevitable component of the subject and one is always mediated by the shared experience with the others. And third point, starting from here, I will try to show, Butler tries to develop a double-edged concept of vulnerability, which is politically useful by understanding that vulnerability is both that which enables us to establish sexual, social, and ethical modes of relationality, and at the same time, that by which we might become subject to exploitation. I will explain this concept and also try to sketch the critical approach uh, to binary thought with, which Butler is assuming here. So first of all, this idea of recognition in, in Hegel, phenomenology of spirit, and how uh, Butler is using this idea. In her book, Giving an Account of Oneself, edited in 2005, Butler asks under which conditions can the question about moral philosophy be made in the contemporary social <coughs> context. This approach takes for granted not only that moral questions arise in the context of social relations, but also that the very same form of these questions changes and depends on this context. This applies, of course, to the idea of the self or subject. Clearly, there is no moral, says Butler, without a certain self or I, but what is this self, what is or what am I? In which terms can it appropriate morality or give account of itself or myself? How does the self behave in relation to the context of social relations and conditioning moral norms? This does not imply, as some readings of Foucault would affirm, that the self is a mere product or instrument of a previous net of power relations. The self, Butler is underlining this point, has an entity of its own, but this entity is already intertwined in a social temporality which exceeds its own narrative capacities. There is no history of the self which isn't, at the same time, the history of, it, of its relations with a series of norms. And then, after studying along the lines of Nietzsche and Foucault, how the existence of these norms in here, in the ontology and formation of the subject, Butler notes that the relation of the self with the norm and the emerging formation and recognition is not enough. So this Nietzschean perspective is not enough. Another step is still left. She, I quote, Recognition never occurs in unilateral way. As soon as I give it, it is potentially given to me, and my way of offering it, it's potential, and my way of offering it is potentially offered to me. This is precisely what Hegel demonstrated in Phenomenology of Spirits section, Lordship and Bondage, or as it sometimes is commonly known, the master and the slave section. There, Hegel shows that one self-conscious cannot have a unilateral effect on other self-conscious. This is made clear on the case of dominion, when one tries to gain dominion or power over the other and maintain a sovereign position. One sees that it acts only insofar and as the other does the same. 
That's why recognition among them never occurs in the form of a pure offering. I receive it in the act of offering it, as Butler said. The title of the section is clear enough. Selbstständigkeit und Selbstständigkeit der Selbstbewusstseins, Independence and Dependence of the Self-Consciousness. So this, this relation between what is to be independent and what is to be dependent is what Hegel will uh, develop here. And the question is this one. Up to what extent can a consciousness be independent on its relationship with, other, with, an, with another consciousness? Hegel starts with just the opposite evidence. If we, then we who are reading the development of the consciousness on, on, on its way through the phenomenology, pay attention to what is happening to the consciousness on its relation to other, we must acknowledge the following, which is counterintuitive maybe, no? Self-consciousness exists in, it, in itself and for itself in that and by the fact that, so only insofar, as it exists for another self-consciousness. That is to say, it is only by being acknowledged or recognized. One exists as one, as Adriana was explaining, uh, for Hegel only so far as it is recognized by other. If this recognition doesn't take place, one cannot qualify as one. Apparently, we have the action of one alone, but this action at the same time it's, is at the same time its own action and the action of the other as well. Because the other is likewise independent, says Hegel, shut up within itself. The same fact that the other is independent means that he is the same as the first. So both are intertwined in the same uh, process. The process then, says Hegel, I quote, is absolutely the double process of both self-consciousnesses. Each sees the other do the same as itself. Each itself does what it demands on the part of the other. And for that reason, does what it does only so far as the other does the same. Action from one side will only be uh, as action from one side only would be useless because what is to happen can only be brought about by means of both. The section argues how the consciousness which believes to exist for itself, that is the Lord or the Master, is turned into the opposite, precisely because he cannot uh, stay as this Master, and becomes the opposite of what, it's, of what it wants to be and becomes a boatsman or slave. I quote Hegel, so too, bondage will, when completed, pass into the opposite of what it immediately is. Being a consciousness repressed within itself, it will enter into itself and change round into real and true independence. So the dependent will become independent as it is recognized by the other and vice versa. That way, the conclusion is for Hegel that the truth of independence is dependence. So here is a critical discussion of, of this construction of the liberal individual that we were seeing in the, in our, with our previous colleague. So one, with all this in mind, uh, Butler uh, poses a couple of questions. So for example, what kind of selfness, what uh, idea of the self is acting here, or, or as she put it, is the other capable of executing this in the same way as me, or is this a kind of encounter with an absolute other or the total alternative? what notion of subject emerges from here. Sorry because the Hegel quotes in English <laughs> were a bit confusing, but I think the, the use of, of pattern of this test is, is quite clear. So the question is what kind of subject can, can we think from here. So we reach the second point, and as I, as I said at the beginning, uh, the subject which emerged from this uh, idea of, of Hegel is not a sovereign subject. It's not a totally independent subject, but a subject who is out of itself, who is immediately in contact with others, or who is constituted by others. In response to the interpretations which believe that Hegel's subject appropriates that which is outside it in a kind of imperialistic way, so like here is the sovereign subject and he's appropriating the whole world, Butler, following the thoughts of Malabourne and C, is not doesn't agree with this view and states, on the contrary, that Hegel's relation with the other is ecstatic, so eccentric in the sense of out of one's center or out of himself. So that the exteriority of the self or the self out of itself cannot be surpassed. This is an inherent condition of the subject. A final moment of appropriation or reconciliation for a total subject doesn't exist. As Gijek put it, the true Hegelian position actually is that there is simply no absolute subject. Because in Hegel, subject is nothing but the same moment of self-deception 
the high risk of affirming oneself in the very exclusive particularity which necessarily turns against itself and ends in self-negation. So the pretension to be absolute for Hegel will result in, in a continuous failure, which will at the end negate itself. And in this sense, is Zizek uh, saying that there is no absolute subject. The movement of the self is the revelation of the deception of particular affirmation. Hegel became Hegel against Schelling, says Zizek, when he accept, accepted that there isn't any absolute above or over the oppositions and contradictions which belong to the fit, our interactions with others in the, in the finite uh, uh, world. The absolute is nothing above the reflection on these finite determinations. On the contrary, it's the absolute reflection on himself. <coughs> to properly address this notion of reflection in Hegel, we will have to reach out to the science of logic and the doctrine of essence, but this is beyond the scope of this work. So what we need to keep in mind is this idea, this idea that for Hegel, or the Hegel which Butler is trying to read, this other which is eccentric out of himself is constantly undermining this presumption of a subject who is absolute and sovereign. Subject, says Dijek, is the name of the non-substantial agency of appearance, illusion, fragmentation, finitude, and so on. There is no absolute subject. The subject as such is relative, is trapped in its own self-fragmentation. This is Dijek reading Hegel too. So, not only the subject is, uh, is relative, moreover, what can be said is that, that the shared experience with the others transform what I myself I, what, am, what, what I myself am or what the, what the subject is. I am no longer capable of being what I was as now I am what I become with the others. The self only becomes what it is, it only speaks and knows itself, and I keep this it pronoun to, to, to make it uh, more open, not saying himself. Um, the self only becomes what it is, or she, or he, or whatever, by dislocating this first person pers perspective. Um, Butler uh, quotes a, a book by Jean-Luc Nancy, uh, which is The Restlessness of the Negative, uh, and, and this book elaborates on this notion of subject, which, which uh, she is trying to recover from, from Hegel. I will quote a couple of, of, of sentences from, from there, from Nancy's book. Um, this work from Nancy begins with a very serious statement. Nancy claims that Hegel is the thinker which inaugurates the modern world. And what does this mean? This, mean? this means that he takes the death of meaning as the starting point of his philosophy, the death of sense. Sense as a, a religious bond uh, for a community. The, the, this bond is not more taken for, for granted. Philosophy starts in the grey world of the opposite of particularity of individual interest. I quote Nancy, an absolute negativity of the absolute seems to conform every possible experience of this world and its self-consciousness. So the absolute is no present nor available. Uh, those who pretend to drink it directly from the infinite universe are labeled by Hegel uh, with this name as sentimental, fanatic or, in one word, ro romantic. Only the long path of exteriority, determination, finitude and negativity lead to the throne of the absolute, as we read on the last page of Phenomenology. Philosophy is no longer the immediate access to a revealed higher being, but the knowledge of a certain nothingness or not being or appearance. And here the idea of, of subject arises. This knowledge, as the process by which the self finds itself in, li in this long road through negation and contradiction, this knowledge constitutes a subject, that we, we, which we will call a subject. Hegel, says Nancy, intends to think how the dark knowledge in which the world is experienced is actually the knowledge of the self as a not given relation or an infinite relation. In which way then that or he or she, I would add, which Hegel calls subject is revealed and it's an and in which way the subject constitutes and liberates itself in the dimension and according to the logic of the negation of the given. So this, so this subject that, that should be clear uh, for now is not a subjectivity in the form of interiority but just the form and the movement of a relation with oneself, a path to oneself and the arrival at oneself but we see this path can only occur uh, mm -hmm. uh, meeting with, with others. 
So subject is then the self-consciousness of separation, or better, says Nancy, it's conscious only as, as separation and movement towards itself mediated by others. So its reality, its Wirklichkeit, says Nancy, is a living restlessness, because it's not complicated, it's not absolute, it's not uh, finished. So uh, the last point, um, what I what I pretend to to explain now is that uh, I think that this I think that uh, the, in this way uh, in which Wagner is reading Hegel and this notion of a subject which is out of himself can shed some light on the notion of vulnerability which she develops later in in, in order to think the political subject. In a conversation with, with Adriana, uh, that, that is uh, our Serbian colleagues published this year on, on their um, journal, uh, Philosophy and Society, um, Vulnerability says Butler reveals the insufficiency, insufficiency of the sovereign subject. Okay. <laughs> um, so this, this idea of vulnerability reveals that the sovereign subject, which is traditional in our modern political philosophy, is simply not sufficient, it's not enough. And we have to understand in which way this insufficiency plays in certain social and historical conditions, which of course have a lot to do with capitalism, with neoliberalism and... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so <coughs> vulnerability. We we are on this this uh, this. Uh, notion of vulnerability for, for Butler in this conversation with Adriana. Uh, Butler says this, this, this condition is a double edge. It has two, two sides. On the one hand, uh, Butler says one requires vulnerability but also to be sorry, but also to be outside of oneself, delivered over to a world of others and this way establishing sexual, social and ethical modes of relationality. So it's a condition for establishing relations. But on the other hand, and at the same time, it is precisely by virtue of this kind of condition that we become subject to exploitation. So it's a double-edged relation. As we saw with Hegel, it is only by virtue of the openness of the subject to the interaction with others, that being out of oneself, that it comes to be what it actually is, a being in plurality with others, whereby this relation, and I think Hannah Arendt's notion of ineliminable plurality maybe we here, 